Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 25th Future Leaders Training Session from Open UK. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Armine Hemmel this afternoon from, I'm going to say if I can get this Dutch word right, Jouder Solutions, Software Solutions, where Armine is the founder. But Armine is someone who is very well known to all of us across open source as both a technologist and someone who's worked in the governance space for many years. He's been the European coordinator for Linux Defenders since 2012. And I, I think the first time I met Armine, he described his job as a tough job, but someone's got to do it. So I'm going to hand over to Armine to talk about containers today and introduce himself in a little bit more detail. Armine, thank you for helping us reach a quarter of a century. All right, thank you very much. So uh, one, so one correction, Chalder is not a Dutch word, it's actually Icelandic or a Faroese, and it uh, describes an oyster catcher. Oh, really? Well, there's why I couldn't say it, but uh, I'll keep practicing. So the Dutch word would be even more unpronounceable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share my screen. I hope this works. Uh, so if not, then... Oops. Ah, technology. So can you see the presentation right now? Absolutely, it's perfect, Armin. Thank you. All right. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about containers. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I am an engineer. I am not a lawyer, but I talk a lot with lawyers. So one of the things that I used to do, I used to be on the core team of GPLviolations.org for about seven years. Uh, that's a uh, organization, or rather was, it's dormant right now, in Germany that uh, went after violators of the GPL and actually did enforcement also in court. I also worked on the very first prototype of the NixOS Linux distribution. Uh, currently, I'm a board member of NixOS Foundation, and I just did uh, way too many other things uh, to list here. So in my daily life, I help companies with open source license compliance. For example, I do rebuilds, I build disclosure documents, and I also fight off copyright uh, enforcement trolls in court, uh, mostly, again, in Germany. So that's so, what I was referring to, I think, Armin. That's the tough job that somebody's got to do, right? Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not very pleasant, I can tell you. It's, uh, it's uh, draining. It's uh, not very productive. So luckily, the trolls that I've been fighting are currently uh, quite silent. So I'm, I'm happy so I can actually do something else, like talk about containers. All right, so today uh, I'm going to talk about containers. So uh, containers have been quite a rage in the past few days. So, well, not just days, but actually weeks, months. I should have changed that. But anyway, today I will talk a little bit about uh, Docker. Uh, because Docker is the most popular container platform on Linux, and also a little bit about license compliance challenges for Docker containers that my clients have actually brought to me as well, and saying, well, this is something that we uh, need help with that we don't really understand, and that I've been focusing on a little bit as well in the past few months. So Docker is the main containerization system on Linux. Uh, it can be used to deploy applications or services in parallel very quickly without a lot of effort. So it definitely is made with DevOps in mind. So uh, if things like CICD, so continuous integration, continuous development, release early, release often, if that rings a bell, then probably you should look into containers and, and, and Docker. It allows for things like quick iterations and also a very thorough separation of different containers. So you can uh, compartmentalize one service and have it completely separate from another service. So if you are uh, old school, then um, if you remember ch uh, change routes, things like FreeBSD, Jails, and so on, it's a bit like that, but then on steroids. Of course, Docker is not the only one, but it is definitely the most popular one. So today I'm only going to focus uh, on Docker. So why is Docker so dominant is, is, is a good question. So the, because the ideas about Docker, they are not exactly new. Uh, 
some of this stuff, like the, the change with uh, the syscall, it goes back to the 1980s, I think 1982 or 1980. I mean, it's very, very old. But uh, Docker has made implementing these ideas so much easier and more accessible. And therefore, it has become extremely popular for deployment of containers. And I think that just uh, as Git really uh, led to an explosion of open source projects and, and, and uh, having more contributors on board, you can see it's also something like that happening with Docker. So Docker was released and made containers very, very popular. And now I think that one of the main distribution methods is actually Docker. So instead of um, doing Linux distributions, people are just saying like, oh, well, you know, we'll just ship you a Docker container instead of uh, we're going to ship you packages with all of the instructions of how to install it. They just say, you know, we'll just give you a Docker container. So this has definitely changed the landscape of, uh, of software deployment. So Docker containers are not the same as virtual machines, definitely not. They are not complete Linux systems. They only contain a Linux user land, and for example, not the kernel. Uh, the intended use, I'm not saying that people that, that this is how people are using it, but the intended use is to have a single service with all of the dependencies and configurations uh, in one place. And basically it contains all of the necessary information. But there's also a strong focus on separation. So breaking out of a container is difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible but it is difficult and therefore a service is contained. And a, a breach of one container does not easily affect other services or containers, of course, depending on your setup. But so there are basically two, two ways where, how you can see that, that it is a container. So either it contains everything or an application is contained. That's the, uh, probably a little uh, play on language there. So, Technical benefits of using Docker containers is, uh, I mean, it, you can very, very quickly deploy the, uh, software. So compared to a physical hardware uh, device or a virtual machine, it is a lot, lot quicker. So what you can do is you can very easily test out code and, and new versions because you just spin up a container. If it doesn't work, you take it down again. Or you can do things like running parallel versions uh, for, I don't know, acceptance tests, or uh, when you're trying to move one service uh, from one version to the new version, where you are gradually phasing out all of the old versions. So what you do is you have containers, you spin up uh, new containers with a new version, and then you gradually just kill off all of the old uh, containers. Things like release early, release often, that is all, uh, a lot easier with Docker containers. And it is so much easier to scale than physical hardware. I mean, you can literally spin up tens of thousands of containers within a very short period of time. If you want to do that with physical hardware, you probably need a warehouse. So it, it definitely has some, uh, has quite a few benefits. Uh, as I already said, it's very application centric. And so instead of operating system centric, so Many different user lands can be run in parallel on one physical machine. So you can have one Docker container based on Fedora, another one on Alpine, then another one on Ubuntu, and so on. So if you're coming from a DevOps uh, background, then it's a lot easier to deploy compared to the classic Unix or Linux environments. So I know that there uh, have been attempts in the past to make it easier to install software across Linux distribution with, for example, the Linux standard base. And then it turns out that there were still some slight variations and slight differences. So you still had to test on every Linux distribution, even though they were supposed to be exactly the same in functionality. And Docker just completely circumvents this, uh, this issue. So, a bit of terminology that I have to explain uh, first. So in, in Docker land, there uh, you often have, so they're, they're, they often talk about Docker's, uh, so Docker containers and images, but there's actually a difference there. So an image uh, 
is the on-disk representation of a service with all the dependencies and configuration, but without the user data. And a container is a running instance of such a Docker image. And one image can be instantiated many, many, many times. And the user data is stored separately per container, and it's stored separately from the image. So the image never contains the user data, and you can instantiate many uh, containers from one single image. So that is important to, to understand. So when people are talking about containers, they're talking about the running instance. When they're talking about an image, they're talking about the on-disk representation. That is an important distinction to make. So Docker images are built using so-called layers. So first you have a base image, and then you have additional layers that either install software, remove or update software, or do basically anything else that you can do on a Linux system. So base images and also layers can be reused. So people are building libraries of base images and layers that they just uh, pick from and then just say, no, I'm going to use this base image, or they're creating new images based on base images and layers. And so they have this, these whole libraries of images that they can use and reuse. And this really helps uh, speeding up deployment. So Docker layers are stored next to each other on disk and they are stacked. So if you look at them on a, on a technical level, they're basically just tarballs with a little bit of extra metadata and JSON format. And the JSON describes the order in which the layers are stacked and how each of these layers uh, were made. So nothing else, it's just a tarball with a little bit of uh, extra metadata. And then when a container is built, the, the Docker engine reads this JSON and then um, properly stacks all of the layers. So the visual representation, that looks a little bit like this. So you have a few layers, often called base layers, and, and from a base image, and then you have a custom layer where you put your own stuff in. So Docker images can be made or loaded in basically two ways. Either you can have a complete image with all of the layers and metadata, or you can do an on-the-fly assembly using a so-called Docker file. So the most popular way to do this is actually to use a Docker file and uh, where you basically assemble the image on the fly using uh, registries and uh, repositories or registries. I don't know. I always mix them up. But there are definitely some companies that ship their software as complete images. So then you can just get a very big tarball and say, well, load this into your Docker engine and then you will have the image. So uh, assembling the images using a Docker file, a Docker file is basically just a recipe describing how a Docker image should be assembled. It reads pretty much like a shell script. Uh, there is some predefined syntax that is specific to, uh, to Docker, but most of that is uh, syntactic sugar. And each line corresponds to a Docker layer on disk. And as I already said, anything goes. Because Docker images or containers are basically Linux, Linux systems. So whatever you can do on a Linux system is possible. So if you want to create files, remove files, download files, run commands, it's, it's all possible because it is a Linux system. So a very simple Docker file would be something like this. So line one, it's from Debian and then an empty line and then a command bin echo, hello world. So what this basically means is line one, it says that the base image that uh, should be used is the Debian base image that is then loaded from a repository. Line two is obviously empty. And in line three, it actually uh, executes the command bin echo hello world as soon as a Docker image is instantiated. So meaning turned into a container and then launched. So if you would, um, have this Docker file and then create a, uh, con uh, an image from it and then instantiate a container, then the only thing that you would see is hello world. Quite simple. So 
building it is assuming that there is a directory docker in, in or whatever you want to call it and it contains a docker file then assembling the image is as simple as docker build and then the name of the directory and this will download the image from a repository although I'm not sure if docker calls it repository or registry it doesn't really matter that much uh, some download location and it executes the uh, instructions from the docker file and then create the image so a repository is basically a collection of base images and layers that has been made uh, searchable so all, so the software for running a repository is open source so anyone can run a repository uh, there are quite a few repositories the most popular one is run by docker uh, incorporated the uh, the company behind docker but fedora and red hat they also have their own repositories so depending on um, on which distribution you use you might have some repositories pre-installed or not and then there are also several companies that actually have their in-house repositories and which repository to use is not determined in the docker file but actually in the configuration file on your system so uh, the configuration file for the docker engine on your system and this means that uh, it depends on the configuration of your system whether or not the uh, docker base images that you load from a repository are the same or not so it could be that you have one docker file you run it on two systems and depending on the configuration of the docker engine you can actually get different base images so you can already see probably where i'm going with this but that that is something to keep in mind that the docker file itself does not contain enough information to actually uh, describe everything that you need for a docker image so docker repositories they can be used to download software but they can also be um, used to publish base images and layers so it's not just a uh, also depends on the configuration of the docker repository but it's not just for download but also for uh, for publishing so layers in a docker uh, image they're stacked uh, on top of each other and during runtime as a container what you see is actually a squashed view so docker layers or docker commands they actually do not modify other layers but they only modify the view so that this means that there's that there are no destructive uh, upgrades and deleting software in a layer does not actually remove the software from disk it just hides it hides it from your view so say you have a base layer with a few packages and then you have an intermediate layer that deletes a few files and then you also have a top layer that modifies a few files so on disk it all of the software would still be there but your view of it would be something like this so a few of the packages that i have in this slide so f g and h they're no longer there and b and c have been modified but when you run the container this is what you will see but on disk actually still everything will be there so that that is something to uh, to keep in mind so <clears throat> this brings me to docker and license compliance um, there are a few ways how you can uh, distribute a docker image so you can uh, distribute a complete image with all of the layers uh, but you could also distribute base images or layers via a repository or you could just distribute a docker file and these have all some different implications when it comes to to license compliance so license compliance for a full image which basically means all of the layers is relatively straightforward the only thing that you have to keep in mind is that you have to be compliant for the software in every single layer and you have to remember that software is actually never deleted in docker layers the difficulties here is that uh, as soon as you want to ship source code with the image it is difficult in, uh, to do this inside the docker ecosystem so if you have via repository or via extra layers uh, it just makes it makes it quite difficult to do because the docker 
the Docker engineers, so, so when, when they built Docker, they didn't actually have compliance in mind. It, what they cared about was deployment of software, not <laughs> legal compliance. Don't, uh, this is biting us uh, somewhat now. Uh, another difficulty is that it is not you have to you actually have to be thorough it's lots of bookkeeping and it's easy to miss something unless you are thorough so you have to be very thorough uh, make sure that you don't miss anything and and but then it, it's not very different compared to the compliance of i don't know a, a dvd player or a, a router it's very very similar so uh, Docker repositories, uh, they currently have no way to push additional metadata such as source codes uh, next to layers or images. Uh, this is difficult. So one of the things that you cannot do, you cannot push a uh, source code or you cannot push a written offer or a copyright author license statements and so on. That, that's very difficult to do in a Docker repository. What you possibly might be able to do is modify your layer to include that information, but then you also need to make sure that a user can actually see that information. And that, that, is, a, that is quite difficult. So uh, the Docker repositories, they have no additional mechanisms to actually help you with this, because again, they mostly cared about deployment and not about compliance. Adding extra layers uh, with code, it is possible, but complicated when you want to have a lean and mean container, and it, which also kind of defeats the purpose. I mean, you want to have everything in there with, with just all of the dependencies that you, that you want, and then you also have to put all of this source code in there, which basically uh, makes your containers so much bigger. So uh, from a deployment point of view, uh, this would be an absolute nightmare. From a compliance point of view, not having it would also be a, probably a, a bit of a nightmare. So, Docker file compliance this is quite interesting because is distributing a Docker file distribution according to the license? So, I'm going to give some non lawyer thoughts because I know there are some lawyers on the call. So, they would be a, a little bit mad if I would be giving legal, uh, legal advice. Uh, but it's debatable because no software is distributed. It is just a recipe. But the result of distributing the recipe and executing the, the commands in the, in the recipe is that software is being distributed. So you could also argue that, well, you know, there's intention. Regardless of what it is, I, I think it's recommended to try to make sure that you still have the complete and corresponding source code available regardless of uh, what the lawyers say. I mean, it's, it's it's good practice anyway. So if you're getting some open source software and binary form, also try to get the source code because it might get pulled. So it's, it's, it's a best practices. Uh, it's a best practice anyway, so. Then uh, when you're actually starting to do compliance, you need to find out what your Docker images use or when you're distributing it, what actually is inside there. And finding out what Docker images use can be difficult because Docker files can be nested, Docker files can import other Docker files and so on. It's determined by the configuration of the host system as I already said. And to do a good job, you absolutely need to have tooling. So uh, there's quite a bit of tooling around uh, Docker and Docker compliance these days, luckily, I must say. But one example for that is the uh, tool called Turn. So Turn was originally made by VMware, and it is a tool to help with license compliance for Docker images. It inspects images and prints out information layer by layer. So it partially relies on the package manager used in the Docker image, but it has uh, quite a bit of support for most of the used uh, Linux distributions like Ubuntu and Debian, Fedora, Alpine, and so on. Turn itself is also open source under BSD2 uh, clause, and it is part of Linux Foundation's uh, ACT project. 
and you can just uh, grab it on GitHub. It's a Python script. It's quite easy to, uh, to use. And they also have all kinds of uh, support for either human readable output or machine readable output. And it's, it's quite, uh, quite useful. But there are also quite a few other tools out there. So if you're going to do a Docker license compliance, I would recommend that you also um, look into the other tools as well. So uh, then there's another side of Docker because whenever there are license compliance issues, then the security issues are usually not very far away. Uh, quite a few Docker files have some very, very serious issues. So Dirk Hondo from VMware, he actually uh, gave a few talks about this. And what his team found is that there are many Docker files where one of the commands is downloading a random binary from some user's GitHub account, making it executable and running it in your container which of course is not a smart thing to do. You're just downloading random content from the internet and then executing it on your own machine. Don't do it. <laughs> so uh, there are uh, also things like configuration issues with, with regards to which repository to prioritize. So it could be that some non-trusted repositories or uh, random repositories would have a higher uh, basically a higher uh, priority than trusted ones and it, it was a comp if you read their research it's, it's it's quite a quite a nightmare uh, or some docker files would always use the the latest version of a uh, of an image and then you get non-deterministic behavior because uh, when you when you create an image or uh, assemble an image and you do it a few minutes later the base image could have changed and then you actually have a non-deterministic behavior. So you cannot say much about the image and so on and so on. So the lesson there is be careful with what you consume. So that actually uh, raises the question, should you roll your own repository? So uh, setting up your own repositories and rolling your own images, it is a lot of work. But in certain contexts, it might actually be worth the effort. So if you're doing industrial automation and you need to be able to run your uh, Docker containers for 20 years, yeah, probably you might want to invest in this. If you're doing stuff in a military or security context, I would definitely recommend looking into it. So uh, because then you can have very carefully curated images, uh, known open source and contents, and also do easier compliance. I do know that uh, Red Hat is apparently focusing a lot on compliance in their Docker repositories, so it actually can be done. And that actually brings me to the last slide. I'm talking a little bit fast, I guess. Uh, with some resources, I guess that we can share these slides with the audience later on. We will share the slides and we will share the recording, including the next section of Q&A, just in case anyone's not clear, on YouTube and the slides on our website. So what I would recommend is um, definitely reading reading these posts and then because they're, they contain a lot of extra background information. And before I share it, I will also clean up the typos. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was such a great talk. And now we're going to open the floor and see if anyone's got any questions. Katie, while everybody else is warming up to their questions, can I ask Armine something? Yes. So Armine, um, when you're looking at containers, What's the single biggest licensing issue? Is it the distribution point and the trigger, or is there something else? Well, so far, I've, I've not had too many clients come to me with uh, Docker issues. It's, it's really just starting to warm up, which is kind of ironic because uh, nearly five years ago, uh, Eben Moglen from uh, Software Freedom uh, Law Center already said, well, this space is going to become a big, big issue. 
and that was five years ago and then basically a few years nothing happened but now now it's starting to really heat up so one of the things is that that uh, what i'm seeing is that um when companies are distributing a complete image they're they are only focusing on their own application and the dependencies there and they are forgetting that they're also shipping an entire linux distribution so that, that's the biggest issue it's like okay well you know if we're yeah we're very we're compliant with our application said, well that might be true but you're also shipping all of this other stuff for which you also have to be compliant so their um, companies t tend to be a little bit myopic, I would say. Any other does that answer questions? your question? Ooh. It does, and I think it's interesting. And that looks like Andrew's heading to the question spot. I was about to say, yeah, Andrew's up. Oh, Andrew, I don't think we can hear you. It doesn't say you're on mute. Does that? That, you know. Right, I've got two two separate mute buttons going on at the same time. It's very very confusing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one one of the things I might be really helpful to know a little bit more about because I, I don't quite understand this. I mean, I, I understand that um, so uh, a Docker container um, will basically part of its operation will will um, incorporate a whole bunch of code that it's um, obtained from a um, repository registry, whatever you want to call it. Um, how fixed is that? Um, because what I'm thinking about is that if you've got a particular component, um, and um, you know, if it's if you know what the component is, it's a very um, specific version number of that component, then you know what license is applicable to that component. Um, but if um, you, you're able to define that component in a sort of generic way, so you don't know specifically which version is going to be downloaded, then you don't necessarily know which license is going to be applicable to it, because the license might change over time. So um, how sort of deterministic is the process, or is that something that's really at the option of the person who's constructing the Docker container in the first place? I would say the latter. So uh, most people, they just tend to use whatever the uh, Linux distribution the container is based on or the image is based on provides mm -hmm. to them. So if they're using Ubuntu, they will just use the versions of Ubuntu and they might have uh, some extra repositories or they are downloading some something uh, that is guaranteed to work on Ubuntu, but then outside of the, uh, of the um, Linux distribution and the package manager. But most people tend to st uh, tend to stick to the package manager that is uh, that the base image basically provides. But you could, of course, also roll your own container. You could. Uh, the only thing that you need is basically a C library and uh, and, and your programs, and then mm. you're done. Okay. Yep. Thank it's, you. It's basic. It's basically a Linux distribution without the Linux kernel. Yeah. Sure. It's all, sure. It's all the same. So what you could do is you could uh, have a very minimalistic uh, container image based on, for example, the Muscle um, C library, which is under the MIT license, and then have your proprietary application on top, and then you would have no license compliance issue at all, except that you need to provide some uh, copyright notices. Yeah, yeah. Because I guess one of, one of the concerns is, um, you know, obviously if your um, uh, container is um, obtaining uh, code from elsewhere is, you know, lawyers may may well be thinking to themselves, oh, this is good because we're not actually doing the distribution. It's the customer that's that's basically obtaining the code. So, you know, that that's not that's that's not our problem. Uh, but then the issue arises, you know, if you happen to know that that customer is going to be getting hold of code that does not have the appropriate licensing information attached to it. So, effectively, what you're doing is you're, you know, facilitating infringement by whoever is running the repository or the registry, whether that's Docker themselves or, or whether it's a third party repository or registry, then I guess there's sort of potential liability issues might arise there. Uh, possibly, you're the lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, well, I'm just thinking in, in, in terms of, um, you know, I mean, clearly, you know, best advice has to be that, um, uh, you, you know, people do have access to all of the material that they need in terms of source code, um, license texts, um, offers, et cetera, et cetera, as required by the licenses, you know, even if 
um, it's the supplier isn't actually shipping all of it themselves. Um, you know, it, it's I say it's one of these things. You know, I mean, as, as lawyers, we, we frequently um, get asked questions by people. You know, ways to get round open source license compliance, and you know, best advice is always just don't try to get round it. You know, even if we can come up with a technical way that may or may not work, you're going to annoy a lot of people and expose yourself to potential risk. And I, I guess this is one of those lines of thought that people may be thinking, mm, Docker, oh, that's a potential way that I can avoid my license obligations yeah, yeah, in certain yeah, circumstances. Uh, just, just don't do it. You know, that, that's got to be best advice. I, I actually have heard that quite a few times already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Andrew, while you're on there, and we've got you in our mind together, uh, a dangerous duo, I wonder if OpenChain has already taken all of this into account in the work that you guys have done. Is OpenChain ready for containers? And the warnings our mind's given us. Um, yeah, I mean, Open Chain itself is really operates at too high a level um, to be uh, sort of directly impinge on containers. I mean, I, I, clearly, you know, compliance in the container world is something that is necessary in order to be Open Chain compliance. But you know, Open Chain isn't about the specifics of compliance. It's more about creating a framework that makes compliance straightforward and make sure that you have the appropriate practices, procedures, and documentation, etc. So um, I don't think it's really up to Open Chain to go into that level of detail. But clearly, it's you know something that's. Um, very relevant as far as anyone that's looking for open chain compliance and also works in the uh, in, in the area of containers. So you'd have to have an understanding of how your container infrastructure worked and in theory when you have things like uh, open source policies they should apply whatever methodology or mode you're using exactly. for software. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and when, when we are, I mean we, we haven't done um, any uh, specific um, com open chain related compliance work uh, related to containers. Uh, but when that point comes, we'll definitely be auditing people's processes um, you know, to make sure that they are aware of these, these various issues that our mine has been talking about so that the ultimate delivery is going to be compliant. And how much more work do you think that is? You should never ask a lawyer that question. Oh, you know that event. So oh, I can answer that one. And I, I have I have no idea. It, as always, the, the devil is in the details. So, and people are still figuring out the details. Yeah. And what you were saying earlier about replication is that you know the containers sit in isolation. I I literally think of them as Tupperware. I, I know that's probably very female and probably very bad, but I think about um, Tupperware containers that have the, the code in them and um, you you know they can all be very different or they could all be exactly the same i assume when people are building this infrastructure that the sensible way to do it is to standardize and commoditize as you were alluding to earlier Armine. and then if you've got a problem it is a universal problem but you fix it everywhere or do people just tend to, to build them individually and make them all different it uh, depends on the organization i've seen both I think maybe maybe thinking them as, as sort of Tupperware containers is possibly a little bit misleading because, as Armand says, I, th I think it's more like a recipe. So it's like a Tupperware container that would sort of you know nip off down to Tesco's and get its own brand of baked beans to put in there by itself. And the question is, you know, if it decides to go and get baked beans from Tesco's as opposed to getting you know Heinz beans from Waitrose yeah. or whatever happens to be, you know, what's what are the licensing distinctions? So um, that's probably a dreadful analogy. I don't, I don't know, that's, that's the way I think of it. Anyway. You can tell I'm on a diet at the moment. I was going to say, well, yeah, your analogy or mine, Andrew. I like that yeah. where I'm still going to stick to it with the different ingredients going in there. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave you to it. Any more questions, Romain? No? I don't think we've got any in there either. Well, I think we're wrapping up a bit earlier this week, but um, thank you so much again, Maine, for your really interesting talk. And hopefully we'll see lots of you next week where we've got uh, Deb Nicholson talking about the Open Source Initiative. So hopefully see lots of you there.